Devo, welcome to the Democratizing SEO podcast. How are you doing today? Man, I'm fantastic, Austin. Thank you for having me on the show. I appreciate the opportunity. Oh, pleasure. Pleasure to have you on. Today, we're going to talk about crafting brand narratives from vision to impact. And you as a branding expert, it's um, just perfect because I'm someone who's very much interested in branding, um, more so than I was, I would say, probably five years ago or so. Uh, but I'm interested in your story. Mm -hmm. Branding seems very close to, to your heart. Why branding? Why did this come about? Well, I've always been a storyteller. I just didn't know I was a branding storyteller. I didn't know it was called branding. I, for whatever reason, I've been fascinated by storytelling since I was a little kid. You know, my mom jokes around that I always had a book under my arm walking around somewhere. And um, that's never changed for me. I just, I'm fascinated by the ability that, especially when it pertains to, to writing, good writing, how a good writer can sort of transport you into their mind and into their story and into their narrative. And if you really get into a good book and really find good writing and good copy and good, and good authors, it sort of does some cathartic exercise for your mind and just opens you up to a whole bunch of different other opportunities in, in, from their vantage point, from their context that, that really not television can't do. And so, the idea of just storytelling in of itself was, has always been part of my life. It's just always been something that I've, I've been drawn to. And then, you know, fast forward through my career, um, I, I was really sort of – my first gig into real business was after college. And um, I was really fascinated how corporate – the corporation that I worked for would spin stories and spin narratives for both the outside-facing viewer – and the internal employee audience. And no matter what it was, like it could be the worst quarter ever, or it could be the worst situation ever. Like we all about to close business down, but the powers that be would craft this story that sort of shape, reshaped the narrative for the reader. And I was just like, that is not even close to being the truth, but everybody bought that. And so <laughs> I'm, I just been, I'm fascinated how you can tell a story and connect with something or connect with someone. And so I've just always been in love with that idea. And, um, I just didn't know this was going to be a profession for me until, until I got f really far into my entrepreneurial world. I realized, wait, I'm not doing the things that I'm really good at. I'm doing some of the things I'm really good at, but I'm not really sort of tapping into my true superpowers. And so that was sort of a journey, the introspective journey that I took on my own. Hmm. I came across the term um, holistic branding from you. And it just resonated with me. I thought, huh, that's a very interesting term. What does that mean, holistic branding? Well, I, I, I don't know if I, if it's my original term. I've never heard anyone else use it, so I'm going to take credit for it. But um, I first came across it about 15 years ago. I started getting into yoga and really started exploring sort of the idea, the original idea of original yoga, not the Western bastardization of it, mm -hmm. but the original eastern ideology of what yoga is and and the whole idea of yoga is sort of being involved in the process and every touch point of your journey in that process and and in the meditation and in the breathing and in like the the mentality of it and the mindset that you have to establish in order to sort of have a real impact with your with your practice and they always called this they called it the holistic approach and so i just was fascinated by the term i had never heard it before and so as i moved deeper into that practice and i'm still trying to figure that, figure that out, what yoga actually means to me. I, I saw that there was a direct parallel between my entrepreneurial life and yoga and sort of the results-oriented approach that most people take and sort of looking for the instant gratification of things as opposed to really investing their time and energy into the process and understanding that whatever it is you're doing in your business, especially now since that we're talking about, there are touch points throughout every single life cycle of the customer's journey with you. And and so for me, what I saw there is a metaphorical symbology of a direct connection between the idea of Eastern philosophy of this holistic approach to things and running your business and having a holistic approach to how you communicate with your clients, to how you engage with your clients, to how you serve your clients and everything in between. So it's not just servicing your customer. I'm doing a workshop in a couple of weeks on this very topic I don't think a lot of people realize that literally every touch point you have in your business from how you dress to how, to the 
to the how, the how you answer your phone, to your email, to your signature, to your blogging, to your website copy, to how you go on social media. Those are touch points and those are that holistic connections and they're all interconnected and they all eventually, if you do them properly and connect with your ideal client in the in a holistic capacity, they all come back to the same source, which is you providing a service in exchange for a resource to somebody to make their life better, solve a problem for them, or do something for them in exchange for your expertise. And so the term holistic just really seemed to fit for me, and I just sort of started using it on a regular basis, and now I use it to define the process that we go through. Prior prior to, I would say, maybe this year, I my view of branding was, okay, color, scheme, typography, um that's that's pretty much it right keep everything consistent Mm -hmm. i never really thought of what branding is and i'm curious to hear what your response to this would be uh two questions what is branding and what should and can be branded everything can be branded everything is your story it's about considering every single aspect of your brand's interaction with its audience. It's, it, it transcends these visual elements that you're talking about. Um, it, it's messaging, it's customer experience, it's your digital presence, it's your marketing. And what it does is it ensures this cohesive and authentic brand story, which is what your customers ultimately buying from you. They don't buy your product. Your product is fantastic, or it should be at least suitable and functional. But what really connects you to your buyer is the story that you tell them, the narrative that you're shaping for them about the experience, about the impact, about the problem that it solves. It's not just about how it looks because, you know, if I don't like the color red, but if there's a restaurant that only serves food on the color red and I just happen to be madly in love with the experience I get when I go and I walk in the door, they remember my name, they know I like a special table, they know what I like to eat, they bring me a drink, I'm willing to sacrifice my aesthetic design in order to sit at that restaurant just because I love the experience they give me. So that's their branding. And and it goes way beyond visual identity. It's it's literally everything. It's customer experience. It's incorporating your values and your purpose into everything you do so that your team understands it. And then if your team understands it, they become your disciples. They're more inclined to be able to talk to their audience in the same way. It's embracing a digital integration. It's using marketing, traditional marketing. It's literally everything. And, And it's adaptive and dynamic because as you grow with your business and your customer base grows, if you take this approach to making sure that your brand message has clarity and quality and everybody in your business is in is sort of on the same page, then we're all sharing that exact same message with our buyer. Hmm. When you consider branding in search, my SEO hat on always used to, used to think, okay, mm-hmm. SEO keywords, organic keywords or generic keywords rather, um, never really focused on brand led keywords when you think of branding in search why is this important when seos traditionally has have focused on generic keywords well it's a great question i think i think if you stop and think about what keyword searching is in of itself it it becomes crucial in search because what it does is it builds recognition and trust with whoever is searching for whatever keywords you've put in and a well-branded search result conveys reliability and authority because you're in alignment with the same type of keywords that someone else is searching for. And Google is so smart and we are so smart and we have access to information 24 seven and they're doing so many things to create an experience for the user. So instead of just getting generic keywords to pop out, that's what everybody's doing, right? So Google is looking for ways that you can be distinctive in that algorithm, that you can be consistently showing up in a unique value proposition so that when your unique buyer, who you should be marketing to in the first place, is looking for those unique words to find that unique person that's going to sell them that unique solution, Google loves that. And, And the end user loves it because they're like, wait, I literally just searched for these crazy words. They don't think that, but they're like, I'm looking for a holistic brand person who understands this, 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 and the other. And if I pop out, you're sort of like, wow, I actually found that. I mean, how many times have you Googled something or gone to Amazon and like, I'm looking for the most, the most crazy out there 
term that you're looking for and it popped up and it's like how the hell did they know that and so for for and as it relates to search engine optimization if you can really understand what your brand is and what it looks like and what those key words are that someone else might be looking for there you're going to be more inclined to pop up into the top results so that when they do find you there you are and then you can combine that with your cohesive holistic strategy whether it's paid advertising or your blogging or the copy on your website or how you show up on social media and they're all holistic they, that's what i mean by the term everything is interrelated and so if you can figure out a strategy to connect your blog to your website your website to your social media your social media to your paid advertising we're running paid advertising campaigns right now where we've done the research on the data that are tied to specific keywords where people would be looking for our types of services. And so what we do is then we put those into our paid advertising campaign, but we also use them in our social media. We also use them in our, our web copy. We also use them in our blogging that we're doing. And so what happens is Google sees these and it's like, bing, points here, bing, points here, bing, points here. And it just continues to reward you. But the end user also gets rewarded because their results that they found are going to be more in line with what they were actually looking for as opposed to just having to sort through and filter thousands and thousands of results. Mm -hmm. As an SEO looking into, let's say, a highly ranked search term, right? The SEO most likely will look into areas that they see as um, ranking factor areas, right? So they will most likely looking for, they'll most likely be looking for the keywords, right? As a branding expert, when you see a site ranked highly on Google or any other search engine, what does your eyes focus on? Well, I first look to see if they're using paid advertising to promote that because I'm interested to see what their organic words look like versus what their paid words look like. So I want to see if there's consistency there. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I see output like that, I think the first thing I look for are what are some of the key words that I see consistency in those in the output of anything else that came after it? And so when I see the same keyword popping up over and over consecutively in search results, I'm, my eye is really drawn to that right away. Is, is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. Would you say this yeah. is what the average searcher then also focuses on? Or do you think, because the reason I'm asking this is because I think as marketers, we sometimes have a bias towards what we look into, right? Or what we focus on. And I'm always curious as to, okay, are we looking at what the average user, non-marketer also looks at when they're just carrying out their average, their everyday search? Or do they focus on something different? What do you think they, they focus on? Is it the the appeal or what's closely related to what they're seeking from a, from an appeal point of view or branding point of view? Well, I think Google's preference as it pertains to what companies are putting out there, they first and foremost favor brands that are providing relevant, valuable, consistent, trustworthy content. And it's an algorithm, so keep in mind there is error involved with this. But I would say they're generally a lot smarter than I am, and as are you, so call bullshit on this if you feel it. <laughs> I, I think that what Google's going to give the average user is based upon a complex algorithm that takes in everybody's input as it pertains to what they're searching for everybody's input as to as to what people are putting out there in, in form of their own um, copy or their own content or their own social media or their own paid advertising. And it amalgamates all of that. And then how I understand it to work is it compares it against that user's sort of ethos as it pertains to what they generally look for, purchase, buy, watch, seek, smell, taste, etc. And it makes an instantaneous comparative and says, okay, Devo loves looking for watches. Devo loves looking for sunglasses. I love collecting sunglasses. I love collecting shoes. I don't wear shoes very often, but I love shoes. So you'll all notice that when I go to my Instagram or I go to my YouTube or I go into Google, I'm going to start seeing a lot of the same things that I've searched for in the past or a lot of the same things that I've searched for in the past. And and what it does 
is it sees those search results and it says, okay, Devo likes this, 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 and this, and this. And I know that a lot of other people are also looking for this, 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 and this. And here's the cross comparative similarities to that. And here are some, some, and here are some other things that he might not have considered, but are also fall into that paradigm. So we're going to push that out to him as well. And Mm -hmm. so that's my understanding of how it works. Um, tell me if I'm wrong. Um, but that's sort of the, that's, that's the scope and the approach that we take when we put out content so that we can sort of match and amalgamate ourselves within that paradigm. I love that explanation because it looks at it from a different angle. As you just indicated, algorithms are very complex, right? And SEO Mm -hmm. community, we tend to have a very fixed idea of what is, um, ranking factors what are ranking factors right and a word i haven't heard in a very long time going back over 10 years i would say is the words you just mentioned right there ethos and when you think of algorithms and trying to understand algorithms the, the the typical seo wouldn't mention that word so it's very fascinating you use that word because i think search is becoming a lot more personalized now And because of that, the algorithms, there are several ways that you can view how algorithms work. When you think of brands, right, and you look at what they get right versus what they get wrong in order to be found in search, what would those, if you like, top things be? So what are things that people do right and what are are things that people do wrong? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times the end user is only looking at it from their lens. I don't think that they're taking the time to look at it from their buyer's lens. And I think we also do that as business owners a lot of times. We sort of think about, okay, what's good for me right now? What's my path of least resistance? How can I make the most money? How can I have the least amount of error in my efficiency process? When when instead, I feel like we should be looking at it from the end user's perspective because they're ultimately the ones that are going to keep us in business. And so taking the approach that is centered around how can we serve our clients? How can we provide information that solves a problem for them? How can we look at it from the lens of the people that are giving us the money and the revenue to keep us in business in the first place? And, and, I, and anyone who's figured that out has had you'll, – you'll see if you look at the business landscape – their ethos centers around how can we serve first, solve a problem, provide a value so that we have perpetuity in our business. Instead of looking at it from like, you know, I'm here to serve my shareholders and my stakeholders and all I care about is making money and conquering the world and building my empire and I'm going to be the best at everything I do. And that's cool. I mean, I'm not saying that you shouldn't look to make money. You have to make money to be in business, right? That's the currency we exchange. That's the energy that we've chosen to sort of we value in, in terms to grow our business and our brand. But at the same time in growing that, I'm suggesting that there is a way to still serve and operate from an, in, from an outward inward lens as opposed to an inward outward. And, 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 in, and your process for search engine and the content that you put out should also seek to follow that logic. Does that make sense? Mm, yeah, it does. It does. With Google search, I am very much looking into how, from a macro point of view, they are trying to fend off competition. Competition from uh, TikTok as a search engine because they're getting mm. into that area now. And uh, I'll give you an, another search engine, which most people don't necessarily consider, Amazon. When you think of branding in search, are there truths in branding that that's across all types of search engines, whether it be Google, TikTok, Amazon, or whatever it is? Yeah, I think there are some certain truths. I think that if search engine optimization and the people who are responsible for it clearly understood that Telling your brand's story is critical to connecting with your buyer, whether you're big or small. I mean, let's just take some of the major corporations that have had massive amounts of success. Let's say, I don't drink soda, but Coca-Cola. They're masters at marketing. And and they don't sell Coca-Cola. They sell the experience of drinking happy. They sell the experience of opening that can of happy. And they spent 
billions of dollars on patenting and creating a very unique sound that their can of soda makes when you open it. It's different from Mountain Dew. It's different from Pepsi. It's different from any other soda on the market. And it's because of some secret recipe that they've built into the carbonation process and the oxidation process and the way the aluminum interacts with all that. And it makes that... And the bubbles fizzle up out of it, and you can see it. And so they sell that experience of Coca Cola. And again, I don't drink Coke, I don't drink soda, um, but I do know that if I were to pick a soda to drink from, I'm going to look for something that sort of solves some of the things that I would be looking for emotionally. And I think that's what most brands and some brands don't quite capture. And if there are any benchmarks or pillars, it's about being able to connect with an audience on an emotional level. And that doesn't have to be static, benign search engine output. That can be stuff that is storytelling. It's about storytelling is just as equally as important as visibility. Because if you can master both of those and you do get your visibility down and you do have the science understood behind it, who do you think, let's just say you and me comparatively side by side, we sell the exact same thing. Okay, We're doing the exact same thing. But you're way better than me at this, the science of it. And you're also better than me at the visibility of it. And you're way better than me at telling the story. So, But I'm also really good at it too. But we both sort of popped up in the same thing. If I click on if – some, if somebody were to click on both of our output and then see all of your amazingness that you've put into this, the science behind it, the technicality of it, the tactical pieces, the emotional storytelling pieces, the visibility, the aesthetics, everything versus me who's sort of like, yeah, you know, cut some corners here. I'm really about just making money and conquering the world. Who do you think a buyer is going to choose? They're going to choose you every single time because that's what people connect with. And so my long answer to shorten that up for you is being able to tell your story, being able to engage with your audience, being able to provide consistent and and resonant content, and being able to optimize all that using the science that also goes into the process. Hmm. Staying with this macro view then, I'm also very interested in why people use certain search engines. And this interest sparked, I'd say probably maybe in 2020, maybe 2021, um, when I started to uh, spend a lot of time on TikTok. Initially, it was just for fun, right? But I promise I spent time on it just to um, analyze it, right? And what I notice is it's damn addicting, right? So addictive. And the people who are users on it, they almost expect the out, no, not almost. They do expect the algorithm to know them very well in order to serve them with the contents that they want to see, that the algorithms t- thinks they want to see, right? There's this phrase, um, the alg- I was on the wrong side of the algorithm. It's a thing within social media. Mm. And I'm looking at all of this from a macro point of view and saying, okay, this is, there's something big about to happen. Why is it, my question to you is, why is it, why do you think these giants, TikTok, Google, Amazon, hell, even Facebook and Insta, why is it they know how, why do they connect with their audience in a way that, let's say, a a, a search engine like Yahoo struggles? So the question is, why do companies like Google or Facebook or anybody for that matter, why do they have success on certain connection points versus companies who do not? That's a better way of phrasing it. Is that the question? (laughs) Yeah. Um, I suppose there's a, man, that's a whole rabbit hole of philosophical pieces that, that we could (laughs) could dive into. Uh, You know, I, I don't necessarily understand, you know, sometimes why certain people lead companies, to be honest with you. (laughs) I'm sure there's a lot of politics that are involved in that. I I think that it really comes down to, and I'm going to use the word again. I really think it comes down to the personal philosophical approach that, leadership takes first and foremost with their company. And I would venture to argue that those who are having less success have more of a top-down effect or a top-down philosophy than a bottom-up philosophy. And what I mean by that is a top-down is like, it's that former model I was talking about where it's, this is my vision, this is how I'm going to do it, and this is the way we're going to go about it. And so, and that may not work. And that's why CEOs, you often see it's a rotating chair of replacement. If they're not performing, then they get replaced. I mean, how many times have you seen in the last 
year alone, big name CEOs have been replaced. Or even like, let's just borrow sports. Like how many times are coaches or, or head coaches removed from the program because they weren't achieving the results they wanted? And so you, know, you can take that any which way you want. But at the, bo- at, at the end of the day, companies who, who are having success – Understand that it's the user that ultimately keeps them in business. And so, you know, people like, people like Google, for example, are spending billions of dollars on creating this experiential output for all of the people who are using their software to make sure that it's enhancing the user experience and there's greater efficiency involved and they're facilitating deeper, more informed decisions in that process. And they're expanding the scope of their search queries to, in, to really, to, and they're using AI now to do that, by the way, or they have been for a while. We just mm-hmm. now know about it, but they're using it to create these more nuanced and specific questions that a typical if you don't spend the time to understand how the science of it works, if you don't spend the time to understand what your user wants, you're probably not going to understand the scope of what that looks like for the output you're asking your search engine to produce, right? It's sort of like using AI. I had an argument the other day or a debate with with somebody who was saying that AI is useless. It just gives them generic answers. You know, he's, he's afraid he's going to take over his job. And I was like, is there a way to reframe that in a minute? And so... Think about AI as just sort of that really amazing employee that you hire to sort of handle all of your minutia and your tasks and your bot and in your business, whether it's a virtual assistant or it's your admin. And think about how well equipped would he or she be if you didn't arm them first and foremost with what it was you expected from them, what it was you wanted to see from them, what sort of output you wanted them to, to convey, et cetera. How do you want them to, you know, deliver their, d- deliver the, 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 the information you're asking them to, to. And so AI works the same way. And Google has figured that out and as have other companies that the more intuitive they can be and the more indicative the user can be by providing an experience for them, the more descriptive, the more understanding that AI will have for that. And so long I get a bit long winded. Sorry, I love this topic. That's that's fine. I think it's I, a, there's some subject Yeah. Are we good? <laughs> yeah, go for it. Go for it. Yeah, I I think there's some subjectivity to it and, and I think, you know, my context is is gonna drive my decision on this. But I really think the bottom line is that companies like Facebook Companies like Google, companies like Yahoo, and anyone else who doesn't have the same level of success, they they might have different expectations for what they're hoping their search tool will provide. And they're not necessarily in line. Google has done a really good job of understanding that enhancing the customer user experience and and and, and expanding the scope of search queries and into integrating converse, uh, conversational search into the paradigm and and leveraging comprehensive data, for example, for shopping. Like they they're integrated everywhere, and so they know that when I log in today, they even know what time I'm typically going to sit down on my computer in the morning, <laughs> and because of that. They're able to leverage data, create an experience, be more intuitive, facilitating deeper connections with me. And they know that this is the type of stuff that I'm going to be looking for. And based upon everything else that I said, it's just, it's just going to go into, it's going to provide a more qualitative and quantitative experience for me. And I, and I don't use Yahoo. I don't even, I don't even know the last time I logged into Yahoo. And, and, and there were reasons why I turned away from it a long time ago. It was just, it was confusing. There was just stuff all over the place. I'm searching for red balloons that I can customize with my own logo on it. And I'm getting stuff on, you know, taking tours in the Kalahari. And I'm just like, that has no, de- that has no meaning for me. Why would I do that? Just because, it- so anyhow, yeah, that's my long story of, to answer that question. <laughs> I, I, I want to get onto your thoughts, um, on SGE. And I'm sure you'll have a, a lot to say around Google SGE. But to, to wrap up this, um, this section on, um, uh, branding, is it then data that's the key to a, a, a brand being able to resonate with its audience? I ask that because you have Google, you know, big on data, right? And Yahoo, it's, they don't, I don't feel like Yahoo get me whenever I use, or whenever I used to use Yahoo. Whereas Google, the clean design of it just looks like it's inviting me to do, um, to carry out a search. So do you think they've considered all of this, right? And Google has considered all of this and created something that's very simplified because they've carried out the data research or analysis 
and figured, okay, this person wants this sort of view when they are at this stage of their search and at a different stage, they want this information. Yeah, I think at the backbone of everything, it's uh, it's numerical data. Because if if you have data on on the types of queries that your audience is using, and there's what seven and a half billion, eight billion people on the planet now, and I would argue that at least seven a billion of those are using some sort of a search tool. So they're collecting data every single time you sit down on your phone, or every single time mm-hmm. you go to a page, every time you, and not even just Google pages. I mean, they're they're monitoring the traffic of everything, like literally everything. What kind of photos do you receive? What kind of photos yep. do you send? What kind of Websites do you visit? What kind of vi- what kind of websites do your friends share with you when you text message each other? What's your conversation look like? News bulletin. If you're, people aren't aware of this, that's all monitored now. Like and they have everything that you do, and and if you can imagine, like let's say you get arrested. Here's a, here's my simple explanation for this. If you get arrested, and I've never been arrested, just saying, they create sort of a case profile on you, right? When you go down to the, the police, the precinct, right? You know, they take your thumbprint, they take photograph of you, profile, forward facing, and they create sort of a data algorithm on who you are and then all that sort of stuff. And that stuff goes into the system. Well, Google works the same way. They've created a profile on all 7.5 billion people on the planet that have ever logged into any sort of digital system, and they've created a profile on them. And they know they know your buying patterns. They know where you shop. They they integrate with your Google Maps, so they know where you drive. Like how many times you've been on the road? And I use Google Maps because I travel a lot. And they'll be like, "Oh, I see you're going from point A to B. We just discovered a faster, more optimal route because there's traffic mm-hmm. on the way. Would you like to accept this route?" And it's like, and I always accept the route. And so yeah. my, my point in saying that is that they have data on everything. So data is the backbone of it. But what 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 separates them this this Google SGE, it's a great question. What I think separates or where Google's trying to go with this SGE is they they're the ones using the data. They don't want us to use the data. They want to give us the they want to give us the outputs of the data so that they can refine our user experience and enhance the depth of knowledge that they provide to us so they can contain us in that pocket of using them repetitively because it's so freaking easy. It's so beautiful. It's so simple. It's optimized. And so this innovation, for from my perspective, it really reflects a significant evolution in how search engines operate and serve their users as opposed to the other way around, which is like just throwing data at us mm-hmm. because they know like we're too freaking smart, man. Like there's just, we're too smart. We have so much information at our hands in a matter of seconds. I can figure out how to create or build or do anything I want from, from this phone. Like in a matter of seconds, I can literally create something. And so Google's figured that out. And so they've created this. This new initiative with their AI, this SGE AI, and, it, and it's going to represent a significant shift in how users ultimately interact with and receive information from search engines. And it's all centered around creating this user experience that is more refined, more intuitive, more helpful, more efficient, more impactful for us so that we become their customer. And so they can sell us ads on the other side of things from the, all the companies that are dumping money into this new system so that they show up in our new operating mantras. Yeah, we're, we're all the product. Um, it seems now, you know, there was a time. It seems now as though the um, new generation, let's say Gen Z, uh, Gen Alpha, they almost want Google, these big tech giants, to know as much information of them as possible in order to service them as best as possible. There was a time in search where people didn't want Google to know anything about them, right? This was just prior to, I would say, prior to personali- personalization. It's almost the opposite now, where users want to give these big tech giants as much information as possible in order to service them as uh, best as they can right even though the user is the product that's sort of like they don't mind that right they'd rather the algorithm algorithm Mm -hmm. knows much about them so if you're looking at sge and google and the new google layout or potentially the new google layout do you think the way they're branding 
SGE and the layout of it is conducive to keep people on Google rather than using different platforms to carry out their search. Well, to there were two things I heard you say that I, if I may touch on them, um, sure. the idea that we're now the idea that we're now giving up our information, almost begging Google to take our information so that they can make our experience easier. It's a double edged sword. Uh, we we've become a nation of of expecting convenience. We've become a world of of expecting things to be easy for us and have immediate results. And because we can Google it and I can build it in a matter of seconds, I expect my entire life to be that way. I expect my business to have immediate success. I expect my relationships to go straight to marriage. Whatever it is, like we have this, they they've and call it purposeful or not, there has been an ideological shift in consumers buying habits because it's been shaped by the convenience and availability of basically everything we need at our fingertips and i'm and i'm talking about primarily you know developed worlds because you know i i just came back from central america and they don't have anything at their fingertips they have nothing but that's a whole different conversation down a rabbit hole so but but as it pertains to information i i think that I think that in our quest to continue to evolve and have information at our fingertips, we just sort of have relinquished our rights because we know what's going to happen anyway. And there's really not a whole lot I can do about it unless I start a revolution. And I'm not really going to do that because that's really uncomfortable. And I don't like being uncomfortable. <laughs> so I'm just going to say, okay, okay, fine. You can have it. If, if you could give me every Amazon result that I want and give me more TV shows. And if you can give me anything I want from Google and I can have it delivered within two hours from Amazon, I will give you my blood type, whatever the F you want. Here it is. And so it's a dangerous, slippery slope, man. I have to, I have to say, like, as much as I love the convenience of it, it's a very slippery slope. Hmm. Now, to answer your second question, which was, do I think that the new interface and the new philosophical approach that Google is trying to create centered around this SGE model, is that going to retain clients or retain users and sort of build I mean, I'm not a prophet, but I would say the proof is in the pudding. If you look at the history of search engines and you take a look at the giants in the world right now, I mean, I would argue that they know better than most of us about everything. And so they must feel like this direction is the way to go. And judging by the lack of tenacity from from users' resistance, I would say that it's probably going to be the right decision for them hmm. because everything that they're doing is centered around the customer now. It's centered around it's centered around making my experience more integrated with my real life model and my real life ethos of everything I consume, eat, recreate, love, hate, all the things. And so they're taking all of that data and they're amalgamating and they're like, here's the profile that we created for Devo. This is what he likes. This is what he doesn't like. This is how quickly he wants it. This is what he likes to do in his spare time. This is what he does for work. This is who he likes to date. This is how he parents. Like This is the type of shoes he wears. And so we're going to make sure that every time he logs onto our system, we're really intuitive in providing him the best possible experience we can because we just want him to buy, 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 consume, consume. Consume, 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 and that's what we've become. So, yeah, I think they're doing a good job with it. They are indeed. They they definitely have me. I have to say. <laughs> In fact, all of them. Yeah. They they all have me. All the big tech giants. <laughs> now, Devo, it's it's amazing to... how it's it's a machine. It's a it, it's a well oiled machine, isn't it? Uh, yep, yep. I admire their 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 marketing. I have to say. <laughs> mm, they Branding. they are masters at it. Branding and um, SEO has, I would say, historically been almost two different types of departments, right? And there's a usually yeah. there's a, a reason for this. There was a time where business leaders didn't want SEO to focus on anything brand related in the SERPs because it was seen anything brand related was seen as the work of other departments, right? So SEOs focus mm -hmm. more on generic based keywords. I don't think that was the right move, but that's a whole different um, discussion. My question is, do you think, no, not do you think, why should SEOs f pay more attention to branding? Well, the old model was centered around um, 
an inward outward perspective of what's going to serve us the best. I don't think early on, especially corporate corporate CEOs, I don't think they really understood that the science of search engine optimization had a direct impact on the branding output or the marketing output of their company. I, I, they did definitely see it in two separate silos, but that's partially the fault of the search engine giants because they didn't place any prominence on that philosophy as well. And so yeah. one could argue that the CEOs were sort of just following the paradigm lead for the people who are the so-called experts. And they're like, oh, well, they're not really giving us the type of data. They're not pushing this experience. They're not pushing this branding storytelling model on us. So we really shouldn't pay too much attention to it. And you and I look like we're roughly the same age. I, I'm not sure, so please don't be offended if I'm way off. But you, you've worked, you've worked for people who are like cadre old giants in the world of advancement. It's like this is the way we've done it. This is the way we always <laughs> done it, and this is the way we're going to continue doing it, right? And so, yeah. you know, I think there's just the wrong type of leadership in the wrong type of position sometimes. And so, I don't mm. think early on people really understood, and I don't think it was always their fault. But as it pertains to today's modern CEO and today's modern business. If you're not embracing branding as a crucial element for establishing a very distinctive online presence, you're in for a big surprise because a strong brand can greatly impact, greatly enhance two of the major things that Google, for example, or SEO is looking for, click-through rates and user engagement by pouring energy, heart and soul and branding into your SEO because a user has too many choices at their disposal now. And if they have to choose between three different options and one of them looks better, tastes better, feels better, smells better, and passes all of the litmus tests of what a user is looking for because it had connected with them emotionally and the company did the right job in telling the right message and the right story, they're going to go with that choice every single time, every mm -hmm. single time. And so Brand, you know, can I just back up for a second? People hate the word branding because it has a bad name. They don't understand it. It's what you said at the beginning. It, oh, it's just, I have a pretty cool logo. I have an amazing <laughs> business card. It's all soft and matted and silky. And people are going to buy from me because I have the best business card on the block. And I fell into that trap early on. I was like, I'm going to go spend all this money on my business card. I'm going to make sure that my logo looks the badass logo. And people are going to be like, oh, look at Devo. Look at his card. Nobody gives a shit about your business card, man. Nobody gives a shit about your business card and so this term branding it was like the wicked stepchild it grew up was like it's like up here it's un it's unapproachable it's like branding who needs branding that's just for like you know we don't need that for our business but branding is not what it's called it should be called storytelling it should be called emotional connectivity it should be called the dynamism and the value that your business brings to the table and what problems do you solve and i don't know how what the acronym is for that but we got to come up with a better word because branding has get, has gotten a bad rap it's sort of like, yeah, well, let's just give it to that guy, Milton. Just go put him down in the basement and let him do some branding for us. And it's like that's, that's what the typical approach a lot of people take at it. And so they couldn't be further from the truth. The core of your business is your brand message. It's literally everything. And so the sooner people can wrap their heads around that, the more success they're going to have with everything else they're doing. Here, yeah, here. Yeah. How many times, Devo, does a person have to see a brand? before they become familiar with the brand? You know, I suppose that's different for everybody. Um, I would argue that instead of focusing on the quantity of times that I am familiar with you, I would focus more on making sure that every single one of my touch points is consistent and says the same message. So that if and when those opportunities are presented to my buyer, they see the same thing on my social media. They say the same thing on my website. They say the same thing on my car that I'm driving down the road because I have a wrap around it. They say the same thing when I answer my phone. They say the same thing when I'm meeting with, with them in person. I would argue more towards being consistent about that than, frequent, than the frequency of it. The frequency is going to be... <clears throat> the equation is, is the other way around. The frequency is going to be determined by the efficacy and impact and consistency of your message. So how many times that takes, you know, if you're doing it the right way, you're going to 
cut that path down. That frequency is going to be less times. If you're not doing it the right way, then the frequency is going to be more times. And you're going to have to dig a little bit deeper in order to connect with that buyer. So I don't know if, sorry, I'm not trying to de- distort your question, but I, a frequency okay. for Go me, for it. it really depends upon the, yeah, it, it just depends upon the, on the company and the user and the consistency of, of how you're doing what you're doing, really. And, and, and then when I do use your product, you sure as hell better be able to support that with what you've been telling me this whole time. Like, right. I'm a buyer, man. I'm in. Like, you sold me, baby. I'm here. Mm-hmm. But now if I try it and I'm like, what the hell is that? That's not even close to what. And I've, I've fallen prey to that before. Like, fancy marketing, fancy branding, great message. I'm like, oh, I got to have it. And then I had arrived in the mail and it was like too small, too big, didn't quite work. I'm like, this is not even close to what you told me it was. And so I'm gone. And so that frequency uh, equation, that's thrown out the window because if you can't match it qualitatively, quantitatively, and consistently, then the frequency that matters not. Hmm. I want to ask you about um, fusion creative branding. Uh, but before I do that, mm-hmm. um, for an SEO, any SEO who's interested in, let's say, improving their brand, their knowledge about branding. Are there any books or courses or information online that you recommend, okay, as essential reading, this is something you need to read up on and um, learn about? Whew, Jesus, where do I start? Um, <laughs> yeah, I've got a book right here that I love. He's a disciple sure. of mine. <laughs> well, first of all, go to my website and read my blog or follow me on social media. <laughs> That's where you first should be going, okay? Yeah. But no, you know, most of the stuff that I have learned has been has been through experience and some con- considerably better people than me. I love Seth Godin. Um, I just think he's fantastic. I, I really do. I think that a lot of the information he shares is is really fantastic. He's down to earth. Um Tony Robbins, if you're sort of into that space, I'm not a big Tony Robbins guy, but he's a master of marketing. He understands the business. He understands the psychology of things. I think they're fantastic reads. Um, I guess it depends on what type of branding you want to do. I'm reading a pretty cool book right now um, by by an author named Mike Kim, and this has been a fantastic book. Um, but it, he's a really cool, cool author. He's very down to earth. He's very he breaks it down in simplistic terms. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm probably a Seth Godin disciple, I guess, if I had to pick any one person. But again, if you if you saw my bookshelf behind me, there's probably there's probably two thousand books up here on business development and and understanding the psychology of your buyers and you know marketing marketing hacks and things of that nature. I I, I don't really feel like it comes down to one particular author. I think the way you consume information is going to be different than how I consume it, and how you interpret it is going to be different than how you interpret it. I think really at the core of of who you should follow or who you should read is you should diversify your portfolio and, and go out and find a lot of different things that really make sense for you. Mm -hmm. Um, and then figure out which of their methods are most in line with what you're able to provide and are able to do. And then, you know, so like not everyone's going to be able to afford some of the tactics that Mike Kim wants me to do, or not everyone's going to be able to have the output or the, or the, or the knowledge to sort of implement some of the strategies that Tony Robbins can do. So there's just, it just, it's all different for everybody. Mm. Fusion. I'm fusion. not trying to screw up the issue, so I hope you know. No, 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 no. That's that's. that's yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I think the um, to 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 surmise the journey, starting the journey, I think is an important step, and from that point, you'll find your way depending on what resonates with you, mm-hmm. depending on what resonates as a brand yeah. to you. Fusion Creative yeah. Branding. Tell me about your your business. Yeah. So uh, this. This company was launched sort of as my way of bridging creativity with strategic marketing. And for 15 years, I have run a very successful photography and videography studio. And one of the things that I was really starting to see patterns develop, because I was looking at the data, is that a lot of the businesses that I was creating content for didn't have any efficacy or strategy around using the content to connect with their buyer. And so I was like, I just made this amazing video for you. I made this amazing photography for you. I create these gra- amazing graphic designs for you. We put all this entire content at your disposal, 
but I'm not seeing you on social media. You know, I'm not seeing any consistency. You don't ever talk about it. You don't have this. And I was like, wait, does my shit suck? And no one really wants to use it. <laughs> but then when I started querying the CEOs of the people that I provided services for, there was this consistent delivery from every single one of them. It's like, we're not really sure what to do with it. I don't have the team to do it. I don't have the resources to manage it. You know, I don't want to get on social media. I don't have time to write blogs, search engine optimization. Who needs it? Blah, 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 blah. And I was like, okay, there's a real gap between the creative output of things and the strategy and the amplification of things. And so I, I started this company working with, working sort of like simultaneously to my other business. And we so what we do is we specialize in, in crafting unique brand identities and narratives for our clients and bridging that gap between the creative output of things, the strategic insights of things and the amplification of using marketing to share that message. And so that's who we are now. And so we work with small businesses, entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, CEOs who are looking to develop a personal brand. You know, maybe you're tired of working in the podcast world and you've done what you wanted to do that. You have a massive amount of success. You have a huge audience, but you feel like you have something bigger and better to tell the world. And so we would help you develop your personal brand, for example, and, and getting you on podcasts and showing up on keynote lectures and finding ways to get your message to a larger, more uniquely qualified audience audience that wants to receive what you do mm -hmm. and where can people find you online fusion creative branding.com is my website and the best way to find me on social media is same handle um, and on instagram at fusion photog short for photography awesome i've just kept the handle because that's my old legacy name i'm probably going to switch it at some point but right now it's still fusion photog so <laughs> lastly devo if SEOs knew this about branding, they can use it to improve a brand's digital presence. What would this be? Storytelling. Storytelling has as, has a, as great or greater impact than just your visibility. Because... If you can master the science behind the visibility piece and have the same accompanying story to go along with your visibility, then you're compounding your impact right there and right there. That's all there is to it. It's simple as that. And if, if you could understand that storytelling is not as complicated as you think, it's about creating engaging content. It's about creating a resonant content stream. It's about being consistent across all your platforms. It's about telling the story of why you're in business to the people who care about why you're in business. It's about talking about the problems that you solve so that when I find you, I'm very clearly understanding of the articulation of what it is that you're going to bring to the table when I choose to spend my money or my time or my resources on you. And so all of that is your story. That's all your branding. That is everything about why your company exists. Why did you choose to have this big audacious dream to start this company to solve somebody's problems that wasn't being solved and so if i if i if, if you can better articulate that story and i hear that story you're going to be more in in line with aligning your business's entire soul for existence with a very specific uniquely qualified buyer who cares about that story you might not care about the sound of coke opening you might not be fascinated by the bubbles and the science behind how the carbonation mixes with the oxygen and the aluminum and it creates the sound like you might not give two shits you might just want to drink sugar and that's all that matters to you so you're going to go find the, the sugariest soda you possibly can but people like me and there is others like me who really just love the idea of picking up this simple can and and, and and the, sci the science shows this because how many times has Coke tried to change their soda <laughs> and got massive backlash from that because they changed that experience that everyone had. And humans are creatures of habit, man. Like we're really not that complicated when it comes down to the scheme of things. Like we like basically the same things over and over for the most part. We like our convenience. We like to know that this is going to be there when we wake up in the morning and our food's going to be cooked a certain way. Like People don't typically want to experiment too much with something that's really working well for them. And that's just the nature of humanity. And, and so if you can figure out a way to tap into that narrative by telling your story and then combining that with really structured and sound strategic SEO, dude, you're, got, you're, like, you're off to a good start. Your business is ready to just catapult. Brilliant place to end it, Devil. Thank you so much for, for being on. Uh, where can people find you personally on online? 
I'm on LinkedIn. Um, just started playing in that sandbox in the last year. I write weekly articles. Um, so I, I everything that I put out there is sort of talking about similar stuff that we're talking about today. Um, I'm on Instagram. And that's really the only two places I play. I, I I've picked my my sandboxes. I'm not really interested in all the other plays. I just I don't have the time for it. Mm-hmm. Um, I play in those two sandboxes, and then of course on my website fusioncreativebranding.com. Awesome. I'll have those links in the description. Devo, thank you so much for for being on. Have a brilliant day. I'm sure we'll we'll catch up again an, another time. My pleasure, Austin. Thanks again for having me. It was really really cool to have this conversation with you. Pleasure.